This, of course, is the lesson that gets people to call me. <laughs> we got to do the really fun stuff that I think is vital to teaching a sexuality lesson, which is talking about verbal and emotional intimacy, relational intimacy, touch and affection. So, 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 so important um, as that foundational piece yeah, of sexuality. Weird. So, um, but yeah, this is the one that usually gets people uh saying hey jennifer can you come do this um as uh, since since the work i do is as a sex therapist and with um with the lovely book some of you might have so the the, i do want to on a very personal note uh yesterday i was enjoying my sabbath rest yesterday literally just spending time with me and god and i was thinking through Psalm 139, you know, that we are knit in our mother's womb. And I totally thought I was being knit in the womb where I'm teaching tomorrow. So (laughs) like literally God was doing his knitting where you guys all live. So there's just a special, very personal piece to being able to um, come and be with you guys. Um, so I'm excited to be here and I hope today is helpful. I'm, um, (laughs) I will end on time. And also, um, I'm going to do my best to leave as much time as we can for some questions. Um, you can send questions to me directly. If you go down on your chat and you choose just my name, it'll come to me. So everybody else won't see the question, or you can send them to my email. And my email is my name, Jennifer Conson at yahoo.com. So Jennifer Conson at yahoo.com. You can send them to me that way. Um, I love it. I just got to be in Tennessee and um, to Huntsville and Nashville, Huntsville, Alabama and Nashville uh, just did a, I did a marriage retreat there. And of course it's so wonderful when I can, the talks over and people come up and ask questions and we talk and they tell me their story. And um I know we're doing this virtually, but I want to give you that same opportunity. You know, if you need to tell me your story, send me the email, tell me your story. And I would be more than happy to, um, you know, give input to the specific things going on for you. Today is going to bring up a lot. Um, your marriage is maybe going great. And today's like a booster. Your marriage is in the area of your sexual relationship may be really challenging. And today could be challenging if that's uh, the case, which in my doing these workshops over the years, it's about 60% of the people that come um, that are, this is an area where they feel like it's not going well and I'm discouraged or, you know, I have no hope. So um, we're going to be talking about that area. You may not be there. You may have loved the validation lesson lesson because you desperately need that in your marriage. And, and you may need to work on that for a while to even put what we're going to talk about today into practice, or you loved the friendship and the sensual touch and the touch and affection that we talked about last time. And you may need to pay attention to that for a while before you get to the point of really putting into practice some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, We're all at different spots, right? Um, So today may be more informational for some couples where they're learning about it and they're able to really put it into practice later. Some of you may be raring to go with some of the things that that I'm going to talk about today. So we're all at different spots. So let me go ahead and just start sharing my slides. Make sure I've got the right set. There it is. So this is the art of sexual intimacy. We did the art of validation. We did the art of um, intimacy in marriage overall. And today is the art of sexual intimacy. So we're going to do a couple different areas. The spiritual view of sexuality, a a view, a spiritual view of sexuality, Um, sexual functioning. I'm a sex therapist. I work within the realm of uh, psychology and medical care for sexuality. So you're going to see that I'm going to go over what are the issues around sexual functioning that couples experience. And then we'll end with some fun and some practicals. Um, so we've done in the, in the previous classes, verbal intimacy was the first one. And then relational touch and affection sensual was the second one. And today is 
sexual intimacy. So ultimately, when it comes to sexuality, how does God even view sex? How does he want us to view sex? We often think of <laughs> the idea of God oh, wow. and sex in the same sentence is like, we would never even put like God is over here and sex is over here. And those two things never come into the same sentence. The very first in-depth book that I read and taught on, on sexuality was called Sex and the Supremacy of Christ. I highly recommend it. I'm going to quote from it a little bit today. Um, but the title, like Sex and the Supremacy of Christ. So I was reading it and sometimes I would forget to put it away and it would be out on my coffee table and people would go, what is that? You know, <laughs> we don't put Christ and sex in the same sentence, you know? So we have this thing where the spirituality of sex is uncomfortable. You know, we don't put those two things, but the scriptures are not like that at all, actually. And so let me show you, I, this is from the book, um, the language and imagery of sexuality are the most graphic and most powerful that the Bible uses to describe the relationship between God and his people, both positively when we are faithful and negatively when we are not. God doesn't do this God over here, sex over here. He actually uses sexual language to let us know him. And I'm going to show you that. When you look at um, Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 23, we see that Sexuality here is actually designed by God as a way, is used by God as a way to communicate who he is so that we can know him more fully. When you look at a, um, Ezekiel 16, he's literally um, talking to the nation of Israel who are worshiping other gods. They're committing idolatry. And he uses the language of adultery to talk to them about what it's like for him. And, and look at the language. He says, um, in, this is in 23. So it's in both 16 and 23. In 23, it says, there she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emission was like that of horses. What the heck? So you longed for the lewdness of your youth when in Egypt, your bosom was caressed and your young breasts were fondled. What is this scripture even in here for? It's like, it doesn't even make sense. In Ezekiel 20, 16 is the one we know the most. And it's the one where um, it talks about how uh, I found you, you were naked, I covered you, I then loved you and gave you jewels and clothing. And then you um, went and prostituted yourself. He's talking to the nation of Israel about their idolatry, about worshiping other gods, but he's using language they understood, language of sexuality to teach them about himself. So I'm a marriage and family therapist, and probably one of the greatest areas of pain that couples bring into me is when there's been a betrayal, or it is one of the areas they are the most fearful of, of there being a betrayal in their marriage. It is so incredibly painful, that kind of um, uh, betrayal to a partner to go be sexually involved with someone else. And, and some of you may have experienced that. God uses our understanding of that pain. He says, that's what I feel when you go worship other gods. That pain of your having, enough, you're having sex with someone other than me, that pain of betrayal, he says, that's what I, God, feel when you worship other gods. So, God literally uses the language of sexuality to show us his heart, to show us his emotion, to show us um, the impact it has on him emotionally. So this whole idea of God here, sex here, just isn't how God is. And it makes sense how God would use sexuality as this language between us and them, because he does that in all areas. Um, he uses the, the physical to explain the spiritual. Um, the trees clap their hands, the rocks cry out, right? 
I, um, I got to do a trip up the coast recently, just a, a, a retreat for me and God. And the 101 and the one here in California is so beautiful. And I got to see the, the coast and I got to get into the redwoods and sing and pray and dance with God. That was my, my retreat. I'm learning how to take personal retreats as a part of my walk with God. And um, I'm in the redwoods surrounded by these crazy, beautiful trees and singing and dancing, hoping no one could hear me. And just, you know, the, the trees cry out, right? I live on the ocean. Like, well, I don't, I'm 15 minutes from the ocean, but when you see the waves, right? Um, I got to sit by a river recently and just watching that water go by. When we see God's creation, we go, wow, this is right. We know as disciples of Jesus that we look at the creation and we see the creator, right? So God uses the physical to teach us the spiritual. And ultimately he did that by incarnating himself into the physical body of Jesus so that we could know him, so we could see him, right? So God does the same thing with sexuality. It is an opportunity for God in a physical sense to show us himself, both positively when we are in, like, this is the the phrase from uh, Piper and Taylor, you know, it's, it's graphic positively when we're faithful and negatively when we're not. So he uses the positive language of sexuality to describe, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, and the negative language of sexuality so that we can know him, right? And this is what's fascinating. When you look at Matthew 1, 25, Joseph did not no Mary till she brought forth a son. This word is the word gnosko in the Greek. So the word used to describe the act of intercourse between Joseph and Mary is this word gnosko. What is that word? You actually see it used in John 10. It says the shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep know me, Jesus says. And then later, I know the father and the father knows me. This is the word word gnosko. This word means a deep experiential knowing. Uh, you think about, so how well do Jesus and God know each other? Well, Jesus is God. So, you know, um, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they like how intimately is the knowledge that Jesus is talking about in John 10, the Father knows me and I, deep, intimate depth of knowledge. And then how well does God know us? Um, right. I was knit in my mother's womb, how intimately he knows my days before any of them happened, right? How intimately does God know us? That's the word that deep, intimate knowing that God uses to describe sex between Joseph and Mary, not because what Jesus and God have is sexual or what we have with God is sexual because that is the word God uses to describe sexual intercourse, that deep, intimate knowing, that's God's intention for sexuality in a married, erotic, sexual relationship, that it be a deep, intimate knowing between these two people. Now, I, I do this work professionally, working with people in their sexual relationships, in their marriages, and, and, and I get to teach in our fellowship all over the majority of couples that are married are not experiencing their sexual, their marital sexual relationship this way, this deep, intimate knowing. So you may not be experiencing that right now. I do want to be clear that that's God's intention. Even when that's not happening in our marriage, that's what God wants to happen in our marriage. That sex isn't just about the orgasm or about intercourse or about what any of those physiological factors it's God intends sex to be about a deep, intimate knowing experientially of the other. That's God's intention. So that's what we want to shoot for. What does God want for our sexual lives? What's really fun, this whole idea of to know, the word gnosko, is also in the Hebrew, um, where it says Adam knew Eve and she came conceived and gave birth to Cain. So that, and it's also in Jeremiah 31, um, they will know me. God is talking about the Israelites. They will, yada is the word in Hebrew, yada. And so Adam, yada, Eve. So it's exactly the same word. It is the same idea 
as Gnosko in Matthew 1, which I just think is fascinating. The two most famous couples that we know had sex, (laughs) Joseph and Mary, Adam and Eve, the word to describe their actual act of having sex is the same, yada, a deep, intimate knowing, right? That's God's our intention for sexuality. What's, What's really crazy is that this word is used in multiple other forms in regards to sexuality overall. So in Romans 1, it says, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies for one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the gnosko of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Same idea in 1 Thessalonians 4, the heathen who do not gnosko God give their bodies over to sexual immorality. So... It's that deep, intimate knowing of God that guards and guides our sexuality. And we're not talking about, I go to church, I read my Bible. This is, I know his heart. I know his character. I know how he feels about me. I know who God is as much as we can know who God is. (laughs) I deeply and intimately know God and that guards and guides my sexuality. The lack of deeply knowing it. God um, leads to depraved sexuality, leads to sexual immorality. So not only does God intend for our marital sexuality to be this deep intimate knowing, but that deep intimate knowing of God guards our whole sexuality, how we steward and live out our sexuality in our entire lives. So, you know, I, um, I had the opportunity to, um, go up to Alaska. I'm running some, um, solitude retreats up there. Y'all can come. Um, and I got to spend 10 days. This was last year. Um, just, I'd never done it before. (laughs) There are people who do it. They go away on these retreats. I'd never done it before. Didn't know what I was going to do. Spending time. I had been reading, um, for the last three to four years, I spent about two years reading the character of God, um, I have an old Thompson chain. I looked up every thing. Uh, you look up God in the Thompson chain and it has like a whole page of God's characteristics. And uh, I st- it took me about two years to get through all of it. And then I did the same thing with the gospels. I just went through all four gospels and just wrote out just all the different things about Jesus' character. It took me all of that about three and a half years. And I just think like I, I've been a Christian now for 34 years. Like I don't ever want to lose this deep, intimate growing of who God is. That's kind of what this, these scriptures are talking about that. We've got to keep that. We've got to retain that who God is deeply knowing him. And then it guards and guides our sexuality. And then it helps us to have that deep, intimate knowing of one another. So that's kind of like an overarching understanding of sexuality um, biblically, right? What is God's intention for erotic sexuality? There is some reteaching that often needs to happen as well. Um, Not only does what does God want for our sexuality, but sometimes there's scriptures that have been taught in ways that haven't been helpful. So I would say the, probably the biggest one is in first Corinthians seven, where it says, you know, um, uh, she gives her body over to him. He uh, owns her body. He gives his body over to her. He owns her body and they don't, um, they, they uh, don't give up, you know, having sex unless you're praying and that there's a marital duty. All of those words are in first Corinthians seven and it gets taught at, just about, you know, every marriage retreat, every time sexuality is taught. And there's some pieces in there that have been a bit um, problematic in how we've conveyed them through the years. The word duty in and of itself is the Greek word ophile, and it does mean debt. It doesn't mean um, what we think of as the word duty. The English word duty doesn't really do a good job expressing it because it sounds like Oh, I got to do my duty. And, and honestly, um, duty sex, meaning, okay, I'm going to give to my partner because I'm supposed to is so common, especially for religious couples. And it's really quite problematic and for various reasons. So let me just kind of 
massage that idea a bit. When you look at the way that this word debt is used is also in Ephesians 5, where it says husbands ought to love their wives. Um, <laughs> so that word is they have a debt to love their wives. It's they have a duty to love their wives. That's actually what it is. In Romans 13, 8, we have a continuing debt to love one another. So it's not this word of, I've got to, it's this, I love you so much, therefore I. Um, It's a similar word that's used when it comes to the cross. Um, You have poured out your love on me so much, and so therefore I. You have forgiven me so much, so therefore I. That's what this word ophile actually means. And so I do think one of the biggest things that comes out when we have to, when I talk with couples about, you know, I, I, I give to my partner because I'm supposed to, and I want to meet their needs. So duty sex, um, where it isn't feeling very fulfilling is that um, I, I always check on the partner side, the spouse's side, how well are you doing in really loving your partner so that sexuality for them comes out of this place of, I feel so loved by you, therefore I want to give to you. Sex is intended to be, in a marital relationship, a mutual giving. And if it doesn't feel that way, if one partner feels like they're giving and they don't really Um, The other partner isn't doing their giving as far as all the other things we were talking about in the previous weeks, you know, that this is spouses where they're giving sexually, but they don't feel emotionally close to their partner. They're going ahead and having sex, but they don't feel like their partner loves them or is affectionate towards them. That's the piece that really we've been missing in 1 Corinthians 7, that that's not a mutually enjoyable sexual relationship. God's intent is that each partner is pouring out their love to the other and the sexuality comes out of that. God doesn't want, I've got to do my duty. That's not what 1 Corinthians 7 is teaching. The other thing is exousia, which is referring to the authority that God gives. Um, it's, it's a delegated authority. Um, in other words, uh, you have money that you earn from work you do and whose money though, is it actually right? When we talk about money, we go, well, it's, it's God's money. Right. And so we give a portion of it in our tithe or whatever. So that's the idea that this word exousia is, is that, um, God made your body and gave it to you and you are housed in it. And you're supposed to be a good steward of your body, right? And then when you're married, you give authority, stewardship of your body over to your partner. Well, how are you supposed to, if you're the steward of your partner's body, how are you supposed to treat their body? Well, um, like think of it this way, when you guys borrow something from a friend, how are you supposed to return it? So it was fun because I actually got to ask that live and everybody in Tennessee and (laughs) in Alabama was like in as good or better condition. And that is the answer I get literally worldwide. When you borrow something, you should return it in as good or better condition. That's the tone of 1 Corinthians 7, that God gave us our bodies um, and we are to steward them well. And then when we're married, we give our body to our partner and you now partner are to be a good steward of your spouse's body and to return it to God in as good or better condition than you got it. It's really fascinating because in Ephesians, it talks about the husband being um, to present, and it it compares the husband to Christ, that Christ is going to present the church as radiant and that that's the role of the husband to present his wife as radiant. So when you return your spouse's body to God, return it radiant that you are to steward, you are, you do have authority over your spouse's body because your spouse gave it to you. But what are you supposed to do with that authority? Are you to use it to demand? No. And that often is how the scripture has been used. Like where people will say, hey, it says in the Bible, you're supposed to have sex with me. So why aren't you? And we teach it from the pulpit. I can't tell you how many times people have shared about different lessons that have been taught within our own fellowship from the pulpit at a marriage retreat, like ladies, come on. And you know, like that message is not exactly going to be inspiring. (laughs) Um, The goal scripturally of that ownership is that 
husbands are to take their wife's body and to bring it pleasure. So this is later in 1 Corinthians um, 7, 34 and 35. Um, where Paul says, ah, don't get married. Oh, okay. The reason is because if you do, then you're not only going to be pleasing, have to please the Lord, but you're also going to be pleasing your spouse. So that actually, that authority that you have matches with how over your spouse's body isn't one of demand sex you need to put out, but it is one of, let me bring pleasure to the body I'm a steward of. That's actually what 1 Corinthians 7 is teaching. I am um, given authority by my partner. They handed their body over to me, and I am to bring pleasure to that body. That, that if you think about it, um, that use of authority where you serve and bring pleasure, that matches with how Jesus talked about authority. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. Don't do authority like your leaders do come to serve. That's what first Corinthians seven is talking about. Not I owe this to my partner and therefore I have sex or my partner owes this to me. It's not that kind of debt. It's the kind of debt that I feel so loved. I want to give. And so partners, how are you doing at really loving your spouse? And that when I am with my partner's body, am I stewarding it? Am I doing a good job of taking care of it, presenting it radiant? That's God's intention out of 1 Corinthians 7. So sometimes we have to do kind of a, a relearning there. We are made stewards of our spouse's body and are called to return them to God in better condition than we received them. And I, and I skipped a point I want to make is that this word exousia, which is ownership, uh, uh, ownership of the body, uh, right there where it says um, the husband's own body, he gives authority over to her, the wife's own body, she gives authority over to him. What it, when you look at it in the Greek, what it means is it's her body, she owns it. It's his body, he owns it. Our, our culture doesn't support it's true for both men and women, but it's especially true for women that they own their body. And I do think a part of, and then they're giving delegated authority and stewardship over to their partner. Um, I've been counseling couples over the last chunk of years and the Me Too movement has really impacted things in, a, in, a, in an important way. And ownership of the female body is just often uh, not happening for women from when they're super early, like as young people, whether they were um, harmed and molested in any way, or just the objectification of the body over history. And so I do think we have the unique opportunity within Christian marriages who follow Jesus to reorient this whole idea of your body was given to you by God and you get to decide what to do with your body. You own it. Female ownership of the body is also a part of really coming back to a real genuine, I joke, a real genuine sexuality mutually that God intends. I joke because I'm a, I'm a sex therapist and I teach people how to say no. <laughs> I teach people how to refuse sex. And I'm, not, I'm barely going to get into that today, but it is one of the biggest things that I do when I'm working with people professionally is actually when I teach people how to say no, their sex gets better. So teaching ownership of the body is a huge piece of healing in marriages. So just a little bit of a relearning um, on 1 Corinthians 7. What else does the Bible say about sex? There's actually some really fun things um, that we can kind of miss. Proverbs 5, may her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. This word intoxicated literally means reeling around drunk, right? That that's how sex, that's how God intends for sex to be. Now, that might not be how your sexual life is going. Again, what I'm showing you here is God's intention that, um, that sex should, of course, 
when someone has, there's actually research on what do people feel when they have an orgasm? And they describe all kinds of words like, you know, the head blowing off and falling off a cliff and an out of body experience that intoxicated reeling around sensation. God intends for sexuality. Um, Satisfy you means drinking to one's fill and saturated. So that's God's intention for how sex should be. Um, Also in 1 Corinthians 7, when Paul says, hey, you unmarried brothers, if you're burning for your person that you're engaged to, you should go get married. Um, That, In other words, that word peru, which is the Greek word burning, um, it means set on fire. He goes, you know, that burning needs to happen in the marital relationship. So go get married. That is God's intention, that there be fire, that there be intoxication for sexuality, Um, that we show each other our our debt of love. We're so loving one another. And then this is probably my favorite part in Proverbs 5 and Song of Solomon 4 is all of these water terms. It compares sexuality to running water, a river, a stream, and a flowing channel. Well, and a cistern, which is interesting. So cisterns are kind of like a well, but the water keeps coming through and refreshing it. You have to dig really deep with a cistern. And they were sometimes used when they were no, not any water in them to as a hiding place. And that's where Joseph was thrown into, right? When he was um, kidnapped and sent to Egypt. So a cistern is a place where the water is kept fresh, and cool. And sometimes you have to dig really deep to get there. You may need this. God's intention for sexuality is that we keep it fresh and cool, refreshed, running water, river, stream. It takes work. It takes that digging down deep where you can be like in a cistern hiding from the cares of the world, right? I love these pictures that God uses to paint, again, how sexuality is supposed to be um, in our marriages. The word fountain is used in Song of Solomon and Proverbs as a beautiful garden, a fountain within a beautiful garden with sparkling water, with lush, fragrant greenery and flowers. This refreshing picture is how is what God uses to describe erotic spiritual sexuality. So I think it's important that we orient everything we're going to talk about the rest of today in this picture of God's intention for sexuality. The reality is for some of you, um, I'm going to come to this in a second. Some of you may not have experienced that in your marriage, may not have experienced that in your background, that sexuality has actually been an area of pain and disappointment and fear and sadness and betrayal and hurt. Um, This is from the book, um, the um, Pipers and Taylor Sex and Supremacy. And it's a compilation of several scriptures from Psalm 10, 147, Jeremiah and Amos. To those for whom sexual experience has resulted in unholy pain, Christ says, I understand well your experience. I hear the cry of the needy, afflicted and broken. Come to me. I am your refuge. I am safe. I will remake what is broken. I will give you reason to trust and then to love. I will remake your joy. Your experience of sexuality might not be all these scriptures we just looked at. It might be full of pain and brokenness where trust has been broken. What's amazing about God is his promise is he hears our cry about those things that have happened, either that we've done things, choices we've made or things people have done to us. God says, I can remake those broken places. I can re I can help you rebuild trust and remake your joy. So even as we go into the rest of this, I want to keep our eyes on our maker who has the power to create new things in broken places. Some of those broken places might be sexual sin in your own marriage. If there is masturbation and pornography that has happened, betrayals in that way, um, they have not only a relational impact, but they also have a personal impact. I work a lot with um, those who are compulsively using pornography or where it's 
created betrayals in the marriage. And it has an impact on the person engaging in them, um, their view of themselves. It has an impact. I get asked a lot. Does it change their sexual arousal patterns if they're doing masturbation with pornography? It can. That's a whole deeper conversation, but it can. Um, it has a spiritual impact. I mean, obviously, because when we don't follow God's plan, it has a spiritual impact. And then the betrayals and all of the pain around these kinds of um, choices impact the partner. And there's re- there's a lot of work that I do with couples around how to heal that relational impact. For some, there may have been affairs and the process of recovery can be steep and difficult and painful. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot is somebody will have a background in um, pornography or an affair, and maybe they haven't used in a couple of years, they've been sober or free from it or pure. And yet the partner's pain still comes up. I was actually in Singapore with um, sitting with a couple and he had been, he had used pornography before and then he hadn't used it in two years. And, um, and they said it was still creating some issues for them. And um, I said, yeah, this, this happens for couples. Sometimes like um, somebody will be, you know, they, they haven't done anything for a while, but then they're, let's say it's the husband who's used and the wife sees him pick up her, his phone and she gets flooded with all the memories. It's two years, three years out. And she gets flooded with the memories of what she saw or what she knew he did on his phone. When she shares it, he might say things like, oh my gosh, when are you going to, you know, for, get, you know, let me out of the doghouse? Are you going to keep holding this against me? You know, when are you going to forgive? And um, I said, so this kind of a, you know, response is common. And the husband and wife who I was talking with in Singapore, he looked at her and she looked at him and they both looked at me and they said, that was the conversation we had last night. And I was like, ah, Yeah. What do we do when someone's pain gets triggered? See, a lot of times we call it the record of wrongs. You're keeping a record of wrongs. You're not forgiving. And sometimes there are aspects of betrayal where someone does have to work through bitterness and pain and anger, their spiritual walk of um, uh, working through betrayals. That is, again, a lot of the work that I do. The reality is, though, when there's been a betrayal in marriage, it is a trauma. It uh, We actually know now more from research, betrayal trauma um, stays in the body. Just like, think of it in terms of like a PTSD trauma. Someone is in the military, they go serve, and they come back, and they have startle reflexes, and they have flashbacks, and they have dreams. So PTSD, we now know happens when children have been abused as children, when they've experienced sexual abuse, when they've been physically abused, and it happens when there's been betrayals in relationships, including in the marital relationship. So what will happen is someone will literally have a flashback. Their whole body goes back to that. And we go, sister, brother, you just need to forgive. Get, you know, you are holding a record of wrongs. There is a difference between a trauma trigger and someone holding a record of wrongs. And sometimes it's a little confusing because they can be kind of interlaced where it is someone needing to work through bitterness, but they are having a trauma trigger. So this is what I usually walk couples through is that when that, when she sees him pick up the phone and she verbalizes it to him, what would it be like if he were to say, ah, right. You saw me pick up the phone and it brought back everything that's happened that I did everything I was involved in. And it makes sense to me. I mean, I did that stuff and you found it on the phone. It makes sense to me that, that that would come up for you. I'm, I am so sorry that what I did then still comes up for you now. And it makes sense that it would. And I'm sorry that my, my choices then still have that impact. Now I'm really glad that you shared it with me. I am. And I want you to share it with me anytime it comes up. Um, I want you to share that with me is, you know, what, what do you need right now? Do you need me to just listen? Do you need me to give you a hug? Do you need me to show you what's on my phone? Do you need me to share with you how I'm doing or how my talks with the guys are going? Like what, 
What do you need right now? What I'm walking you through right there is what I call the healing conversation. Instead of the, oh my gosh, why don't you, you know, let me out of the doghouse? Instead, respond with humility and um, ownership. It spells this lovely mnemonic, uh, reflect, validate, own, express gratitude, and then say, what do I need? It's in my book. Um, There's a chapter in The Art of Intimate Marriage that's on recovery from relational and sexual betrayals. And it's important even on a day like today, because a good chunk of the couples that I'm usually working with in a workshop like this have gone through some form of betrayal, and they don't know how to get to a point of healing when that still comes up. So I'd recommend really thinking about pursuing the that kind of how do I share it in a way that's not an attack and how do I respond in a way that's, that's humble and owning the reality of the trauma coming up. So I call this um, the healing wounds. You'll see it at the bottom of this slide, having that um, healing conversation. Now, sometimes the, the trauma that comes up while you're having sex is about someone's past experiences that aren't that didn't happen in the marriage where there was sexual abuse in the background or violations happen in there, someone's background, or you have a background in sexuality that you feel a lot of game and uh, guilt and shame about all of those things can actually come into to having sex together as a couple today. Doesn't want, it doesn't give us enough time to thoroughly go through how to um, manage those issues, but I want to pay attention to them today that there are ways to actually be closer. Remember, we practice validation on how to be closer through a conflict. A couple can actually be closer after these kinds of injuries to the relationship instead of more divided. They can actually have that. I got flooded when I saw you pick up the phone. They can actually have that conversation and be closer or, hey, when you touched me that way, I just got flooded with, all the stuff from my background, from my parent growing up, when someone shares that to have a healing time um, to slow down and to talk about it. So again, um, there is a whole chapter on that in the book. Why? Because our pasts come into our current sexual relationship and The more healing we can have around those really painful areas, the better our sexual relationship actually can be. So I've covered all of that. And now we're going to get into, and like that's not heavy enough. Now we're going to get into some of the physical challenges that people can have with sexuality. So this is disorders. Um, When you're trained as a therapist, you're trained in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that literally says these are um, sexual dysfunction that people can go to and um, get diagnosed with. So I'm going to go over what some of these diagnoses are. They include sexual, um, genital, and pelvic pain. That can be for men and women. And then the pain can happen at penetration. That's predominantly for women, but sometimes men also will experience pain in their penis or the pelvic floor during penetration. Vestibulodynia is one of the words, and I'm going to show you on a diagram where the vestibule is and the pain in the vestibule. Disorders can also include low desire. It's a little bit of a controversial uh, diagnosis because low desire can be caused by a lot of different things, and I'm going to explain that. Um, Low desire and arousal disorders. It's the number one thing that people come in to get care for with sexual addiction. Premature ejaculation, ejaculating before someone wants to. We're going to talk about that delayed ejaculation, remaining erect, um, but then uh, not reaching orgasm or taking a long time to reach orgasm. And then the most well-known is erectile disorder, having a difficulty maintaining, becoming erect or maintaining erection. And then orgasmic disorder, having a challenging time getting to orgasm, which actually delayed ejaculation is the male orgasmic disorder. They stay erect, but they don't reach an orgasm or it takes a long time. For women, it's called female orgasmic disorder. So they don't reach orgasm or they take a long time to reach orgasm or they rarely reach orgasm. So these are the disorders in the DSM. Um, This is, so I'm also a professor of all of this. So I get to teach this to all of my students and I'm going to show you some of this today. So 
male low desire is the technical term is called male hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And it's one we don't talk about a lot because we think women are the ones with a low desire. Actually about 20 to 30% of the couples that come to see me, it's actually the husband that has the lower desire. Almost every book on sexuality that's written from a Christian standpoint assumes that females are the one with lower desire. When actually it's been, it's um, been, it's, it's very distressing when it's for some couples, when the male has the lower desire. So what that would mean is our culture says that all men want sex and they're ready to have sex like that. And they, they want to have sex all the time. So then if you've got a male who has either an innate low desire or various things in life have brought him to a lower desire. And you've got a female who's expecting him to be like a guy wanting sex and having sex and wanting to have sex all the time and being ready to have sex all the time. Then when he doesn't initiate sex and he doesn't respond to it and isn't as interested, um, often the female is over there going, oh my gosh, well, what's wrong with this? Like, obviously all men want sex and he doesn't. So it must be me. So it often the message comes back to the, the female saying, he's not attracted to me. He must be doing it, some, getting it somewhere else, or he's gay. So that one comes in my office all the time. When I have women whose husbands are not initiating sexually or interested in sex, they often ask me, do you think my husband's gay? Um, and so a part of it comes from this message that all men want sex and they want it all the time. Um, when actually some men from early on have a low sex think about it a lot as teenagers and as young men. So they have more what you call a, a, a primary. They've had low desire pretty much most of their lives. That can be heavily, it overlaps a lot with erectile dysfunction. So if men have problems with erection, um, especially if they have it early in life or even premature ejaculation, that will affect low desire for some men. But also low desire, and this is true for men and women, is affected by so many different factors. So stress, anxiety, anger, um, weight, health, um, heart problems, um, medications that you're on. I'm not even, I have a whole chart that shows all the medications you can go on that affect desire and erectile functioning, um, the ability to reach orgasm. So there are so many factors that affect male low desire. And we tend to think uh, the female might think, oh, it's about me. So there's a lot of distress around it. The reality is people can have really meaningful, enjoyable sex, even without going, ooh, I want to have sex ahead of time. And I'm going to show you some, some more on that in a minute. So that's male hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It can be there are a lot of different treatments for that. That's a whole nother class, but um, there are medical treatments and there are really relational treatments and there is education and pieces like that around that. Uh, another big one is uh, premature ejaculation. I just think this picture is funny. So um, uh, this comes in a bit uh, where someone will say, you know, they'll come in, Dr. Kanzen, we're coming to see you because, you know, we're struggling with, I'm struggling with premature ejaculation and want to get some treatment. And so I'll ask, you know, how many uh, minutes of stimulation before you ejaculate? And so when I was at the REACH conference in um, St. Louis, you know, had a whole crowd and I said, okay, so guys, women, everybody here, throw out some numbers. How many minutes of direct stimulation to the penis before a male will ejaculate? And people are throwing out all kinds of numbers, you know, 10, five and 20, you know, um, two. So people are throwing out all kinds of different numbers. And, it, you know, the, including the large numbers, you, you know, men last, you know, it's, it's, huh, I'm a stud if I last, if I last for 30 minutes, actually the typical male ejaculates between two and five minutes. So stimulation to the penis between two and five minutes, the typical male ejaculates. So I'll have men who come in my office and they say, I'm, I'm struggling with premature ejaculation. And I'll say, how many minutes of stimulation? And they'll say like about three and I'll say, oh, you're cured. You don't have premature ejaculation. You can go home. Don't spend money on me. Um, that doesn't always really fix it because it causes distress because they think they're different than the typical male because all of the guys out there are telling them how long they last. Um, uh, premature ejaculation is actually not diagnosed until it is a minute and under, but also it has to cause distress. I worked with a couple where um, he ejaculated within about 15 seconds of entering her vaginally and he had an orgasm. He was 
perfectly happy with it. She didn't orgasm during intercourse and I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so she was having her orgasms through him stimulating her with his hands. And so it didn't bother her. Neither of them were bothered by it. So it wasn't a part of our treatment, <laughs> you know, it didn't bother them. Um, so the distress about it is often the, the, um, anxiety about it. So it's what you call, um, Ooh, did we just lose our connection here? Okay, there we go. The anxiety about premature ejaculation and erection really cause uh, more of the issue. So in treatment, that's usually what I'm dealing with is the anxiety they feel. It's what you call spectatoring where someone is, whether they're dealing with erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation, they're watching. Oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 oh no. So that worry about, am I going to lose my erection or am I going to ejaculate too soon? And they're, it's like they're watching, they're above their bodies, watching their penis. That's called um, spectatoring and um, performance anxiety. So that's actually a, a, a focus of the treatment when I'm working with couples and with individuals is really helping with the anxiety because anxiety does have an impact, but so do medications. And sometimes people just innately have an early ejaculation. Erectile dysfunction is the most well-known one. Um, we have an, you know, a, a vice president who did an ad on it. Um, you know, got the Viagra commercials out there, you know, he's got his truck with horses in it. And I struggle with erectile dysfunction, you know, and now the newest commercials are this beautiful woman laying on a bed. My husband has erectile dysfunction, you know, so there's all these commercials on Viagra. Viagra came out in 98. I actually work with the lead researcher on Viagra. Dr. Erwin Goldstein is here in San Diego. So I get to, I train, I have trained directly under him. So I have learned a lot about erectile dysfunction through the years. Um, it's the most common one that's talked about. Um, erectile dysfunction uh, is not considered erectile dysfunction until it's 75% of the time where someone cannot maintain, attain or maintain an erection, but you can kind of see it on the clock. You can see it, you know, oh no, he loses it within a few minutes. Um, it doesn't, often it's both an anxiety producer for the male, but it also may be for the female. And in fact, um, I'm working with a couple right now, they're in their thirties. He has erectile dysfunction. He actually just went and saw his um, urologist and he just started taking Cialis and he's so happy. Um, but they, uh, the distress was actually more hers. She was angry and upset and worried. And she said, what are you not attracted to me? And it, so they're coming to see me. They're um, married about seven years and it's been a huge um, area of co conflict between them. So often it's the distress about erectile dysfunction, both for the male and the female that can cause some of the issues. Men do um, start their testosterone starts lowering in their thirties and then it lowers dramatically in their fifties. And then it just keeps lowering quite a bit. So that it's very common for men in their 50s, 60s, and 70s to um, experience erectile dysfunction. But we have all kinds of sexual aids that are out there. Most of the time, though, people don't want to pay the price for Viagra and Cialis and Levitra, so they buy it online. And Viagra is the number one faked medicine out there. So you might be using, you know, some kind of talcum powder instead of um, the actual pill. So just be aware that you, you know, there are, they work, but when Viagra came out in 98, they actually thought that the sex therapist, that's me, would all have nobody coming to their offices because Viagra fixed everything. Actually, the offices got busier because all of a sudden the pill started working and it started revealing that there were other problems that needed to get worked through. So um, there are all kinds of different treatments, not just medication for reptile dysfunction. And that's again, part of the work that I do. Delayed ejaculation. <laughs> I think this picture is so funny. <laughs> the penis remains nice and hard and erect, but it's not shooting. <laughs> so um, delayed ejaculation. I actually worked with a couple where he, they had not had sex in 10 years. They were sleeping in separate bedrooms. By the time they were done um, doing sex therapy with me, they were the funnest couple to work with. And um, they were literally running around naked in their backyard to the hiding place he made for where they were going to have sex <laughs> and, you know, excited when they got home to see each other. So their relationship radically changed. So when I was doing the, they finished therapy and then we did follow-ups and he, he was still, she was having orgasms. He was not, he was remaining erect, but he wasn't reaching orgasm. 
And I said, you know, let me, let me give you the name of the specialist I work with. And he was going to go see him. He, I see them at their next appointment. And he tells me about, I was so embarrassed about my oops on this. Um, his, his doctor says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Erwin Goldstein is great. Go see him. But actually, before you see him, let's take you off of your SSRI. Well, he was on depression medication that I had completely forgotten about because they weren't even having sex when they first started seeing me. So I just didn't remember. <laughs> and I was like, he went off his depression medication and he had an orgasm the following week. So SSRIs for men and women make it difficult to reach orgasm. So, um, and guess what? Your doctors don't tell you that they put you on it and they don't tell you the sexual side effects. So um, that's not the only thing that causes delayed ejaculation. Um, I have a an individual right now, he's had lifelong delayed ejaculation. Um, so uh, it's, it is one of the one that's a little bit more uh, challenging to treat. Um, one of the couples who read my book, they were readers while we were working on publishing it. And he has delayed ejaculation. And he said, he wrote me a note while he was reading. He said, you need to tell your readers that when someone stays erect and it takes them a long time, they're worried. Like, is she tired? Is she going to like, Oh, would you please stop? Would you please get done? Would you please? Well, his wife was also one of my readers and she sent me a note saying, just so you know, I don't actually feel that way or think of those things. <laughs> but what he was sharing was that he felt that anxiety about, is she just sick and tired of how long it's taking me to, to reach ejaculation? So again, Couples therapy, couples treatment, getting together and talking through these things really can be a lot of what helps these different um, issues. <laughs> I love this. Doc, can you write me a prescription for some of that Viagra? And she's back there going, say no. So often we can fix the medical, but there might be more than just the medical going on, right? What about low desire for women? It's actually called a uh, desire and arousal disorder in the manual, which is a problem because they conflated desire. They put them together, desire and arousal. They're actually separate things. Desire is the, Ooh, I want to, I'm thinking about it. I'm fantasizing. I'm dreaming about, right. It's in, it's, it's the way I think and feel arousal is actually the tingling and throbbing. It's the erect penis or it's the tingling and throbbing in the vagina. That's arousal. It's the body, the blood flow to the body. So they actually are two separate things, but for some reason in the diagnostic manual, they put them together. Well, there is a reason because they overlap a lot, especially for women. It is the number one reason why women come to get help. And there are so many factors on that. So I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Uh, female orgasmic disorder. So this is where she is, like I said, she's not reaching orgasm at all. She's never had one. Or when she reaches that it, it takes a really long time, or she thinks it takes a really long time. Um, and, and even though the majority of women take about 20 to 30 minutes to reach orgasm. So that's a issue if men take two to five, and we think that having intercourse, both of them are going to reach an orgasm at the same time, but he takes two to five sec minutes and she takes 20 to 30 of stimulation. We've got a math problem, right? The majority of women, only 30% of women actually reach orgasm during intercourse. The majority of women have their orgasms um, separate from intercourse. And so, but for some women, um, it, they aren't reaching orgasm or not very often, or the, the orgasms are um, infrequent. So this may be your experience or this may be your experience. <laughs> I just like this picture. <laughs> so she's like, that was awesome. He's like, you're welcome. Um, so I do, not only is this a funny picture, but uh, <laughs> often what women express is that the whole really releasing themselves to orgasm, letting their bodies flop, um, all the noises they make while they're in high arousal or reaching or orgasm or what their body does, they might be shaking their jelly and they're embarrassed about it. Like, you know, the worry about the physical body and really releasing. So the, the anxiety about it, the embarrassment about it can actually cause some women not to relax to reach this, this picture's scenario. So um, orgasmic problems can sometimes be really a learning to deal with the anxiety around sexual release. So what about sexual pain? <laughs> this is a funny picture. 
someone's fine and there's a little bit of problem and oh, it's making me cry and okay, this is really bad and oh my gosh, I'm dying. And the other is, okay, this is the worst pain possible and death is imminent. So um, using a scale, the Lego pain assessment tool might not be what your doctor uses, but using a scale to discern just how much pain people are having, um, predominantly women during sex, sex, think of it this way, this pain is a real issue. And what happens is people keep having sex. They keep having intercourse while having pain and that doesn't work. Um, think of it this way. When you, if there's a red burner on and you, are you going to go like this and go, oh, I'm going to put my hand on the red burner? No, <laughs> you know, you're going to, your, your brain says, move away from the pain. When people keep having sex while they're in pain, it actually, the brain says, this is bad, go away, don't do it. So it kills desire and it makes orgasm really difficult. So one of the first things I tell people, if you're experiencing pain during sex, stop having intercourse, do everything else, have outer course, bring each other to orgasm, all kinds of different ways and go get medical help. The problem is grandma and mom and sister and auntie are saying, oh yeah. And the gynecologist, all women have pain. That's just how it works. No. That is not how it works. There are medical answers to pain. And so I tell people, go get the care. The challenge is often people have gone to a gynecologist and, a gyne and gynecologists are not trained in sexual pain unless they've actually trained under someone like Erwin Goldstein. So let me show you some stuff I would recommend. Um, often what people will say is, oh, you have a UTI, you have a yeast infection, you have you know, a tight vaginal canal, and that's why you're having pain. And that's just how it works. That is incorrect. Um, you know, <laughs> you're having dryness and a loss of elasticities of the vaginal tissue. So do people have more pain as they age? Yes. So what, the reason why this is such a weird picture um, to describe skin, but this is literally what happens when women's uh, women and men have testosterone and estrogen, both. When women's estrogen lowers, it affects their vaginal canal, but when their testosterone lowers, which happens when you go on the pill, when you treat your acne, when you um, go through menopause, testosterone lowers and testosterone provides the plumping up of the tissues of the vestibule and around the clitoris and the rest of the erectile tissue that I'm going to explain in a minute. So when women's hormones drop, the skin, not just of the vulva, but of your entire body does get drier and loses elasticity and then intercourse. So you've got the penis coming in and out and those tissues are drier and thinner. And so there's the ripping and tearing of the tissues during that dryness. So that can cause a, be a huge cause for pain. So let me encourage you, if you're experiencing pain in sex, don't have intercourse, go get care, go buy this book, When Sex Hurts, find yourself in this book and take it, find yourself, find your story in there, take it to your gynecologist and say, treat this. This is Erwin Goldstein. You can call him and he will do a 10 minute free consultation. Um, it's expensive to come and see him, but people literally who are my clients come from all over the world. Um, your brothers and sisters have come from Europe and Canada and the East Coast and Alaska. That was all in the last two years. Um, your brothers and sisters have flown in to see him. Um, I have a long-term friend that was the first person I sent to him. So I always ask her, is it okay if I tell your story? So she had pain since she was like a teenager. Um, she had a good sexual relationship with her husband, good sex life. She reached orgasm, good marriage, uh, leaders in the church, but she had pain all the time. And it really was impacting their sexual relationship. So she and I were literally floating in a pool and she's telling me about it. And I said, oh, you need to go see him. And it wasn't cheap. She did. And the big joke everybody makes is the best $2,000 they ever spent. So within six weeks, she was pain-free for the first time in 35 years. And then she's still, she's eight years out and she's pain-free. So there are medical answers. I don't know if this is your medical answer, but I'm just saying there are. So um, I would encourage you to go search that out. Now, let me explain what I've been saying without saying it. Let me explain the anatomy and the physiology around sexual functioning. Um, first of all, what turns your spouse on? You know, there are differences, right? In arousal. <laughs> I just think this is funny. Okay. If a male is dealing with premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction, he might have a few more dials up there, but it is 
not uncommon that it, I had one couple, um, she had never had an orgasm. They, while they were seeing me, they, um, she ended up getting pregnant. And so she actually had her first orgasm when she was eight months pregnant. She thought her water broke. <laughs> And the next week they came back and he was like, I did everything the same and it didn't work. I'm like, I know she's so complicated. So it can be, there's lots of dials and switches and it doesn't always work from time to time because the female anatomy is really complicated. So let me explain it to you. So here's some anatomy and physiology. The reason why I've got different skin tones is because um, when a female is, um, stimulated blood flow. Well, when a male is stimulated, blood flow co co comes to the genitals and it causes erection and, um, and uh, the, the penis becomes erect, the female labia. So she's got labia minora, the small lips and labia majora, the larger lips. They have erectile tissue under them, the lips do. They become filled with blood, just like the penis does. And the lips stand up. Now in a woman of um, lighter tone skin, the, the, the flesh is pinker and it will turn purple. In a woman of color, you won't necessarily see the skin cone, tone the skin tone change because um, uh, you can't see the blood flow as easily, but you will see the standing up of the lips when a woman is at high arousal. So um, you can see all the names of the parts at the, the picture on your, I think on your right, I don't know if it's on your left or right. And the biggest dark hole is the vagina and the vagina is the tube that goes from the opening to the cervix. Then the small little black hole is the urethra. That's where women urinate from. Most women actually don't know where they urinate from. They think they urinate from their, um, their vagina or their clitoris. By the way, this is called the vulva. It's not the vagina. The vagina is the tube going up to the cervix. The vulva is the whole thing. And so just giving some correct anatomical terms. The clitoris is kind of at the top there. And the clitoris is like a little hard knobby piece that protrudes and is under a, a, a fatty tissue. When the clitoris is at high arousal, it actually pulls under that hood and kind of hides. And so then you've got a male trying to find his wife's clitoris and it has hidden. Um, the clitoris though, isn't just that little knobby part that's sticking out. The clitoris is ahead, the part you're feeling, if you actually touch your clitoris or you're feeling your partner's clitoris, that's the pink part in this picture. It's the head, but it has a shaft like a penis and it has legs. It has crura is what they're called, the cruce. So women have crura or legs and those legs, this is, this whole thing is your clitoris, not just the knobby part. And around the clitoris is what you call erectile tissue, the erectile bulbs. So when you stimulate the clitoris, it brings blood flow and causes erectile responses, which stimulates the head. The head is pretty much the seat of reaching orgasm. However, what happens is men will, who are trying to help their wife get to orgasm will say, oh, well, if the clitoris is how she becomes, uh, gets orgasm, he's doing this. And she's like, yeah, no, don't do that. So why? Because the clitoris is all spread out. Think of wipe on, wipe off. Like stimulation isn't like this, right? Um, the clitoris has also got the greatest number of nerve endings. It's, uh, the tongue and the fingers have the most in your body for males and females. The clitoris has three times as many. So the clitoris is both, this can be the seat of pain quickly. It can switch quickly from pleasure to pain. And so communication about what feels good around that stimulation to the female is important. Um, back to this pink part, the darker pink part below the urethra is the vestibule. And the vestibule is where a lot of women feel their pain. Um, that's the darker pink here. And sometimes the pain is caused because the testosterone's low, there's the ripping and tearing sensations from intercourse. What happens is there's, you can't see them in this picture, but there's there's a skeins and Bartholin's glands. There's two sets of glands above and below, and they can become irritated due to low hormones or um, other skin conditions. And you can't see them without a microscope. So someone comes in and the gynecologist looks at it and she says, you're good. And you have to see somebody who actually does a more thorough examination to find out, oh, actually we got to do chest your blood work. 
we got to test your pelvic floor. We've got to test these glands. And, oh, actually, this is what, that's why I mean, like, go find out what your challenge is so that you can get relief from your pain. So, um, yep, that's the female vulva. And we are just about out of time. So I'm going to show you just a couple more things and we are done. Isn't this picture lovely for males? You know, it looks like the poor penis got cut off. Um, so the male penis is, uh, the erection is controlled by blood flow. That's why blood flow is such an issue for male sexual functioning. The corpus cavernosum are the two big, um, they're about the shape and size of a cigar. And then the corpus spongiosum is the spongy tissue it's all erectile tissue. The spongy tissue, it's about the size of a pencil that surrounds their urethra and protects the urethra. Women also have that spongy tissue around their urethra, by the way. When you place the fingers into the vagina and press up, you're touching that spongy tissue. That's the G spot, which is named for Grafenberg, who's a guy. And that's just like so wrong on so many levels. Um, so for males, Blood flow is so important that actually if a male tells me he has erectile dysfunction or he feels like he's not becoming erect regularly, I tell him to go get a checkup at the doctor because it's one of the first signs of heart problems. So um, always, if you're having any erectile issues, go in and check with your doctor. There's similar valves to the penis and the heart, and that's why they can both react. So, and if you're on heart medication, you can't take Viagra. So there's some similarities between um, those two parts of your body, your heart and your penis. So, and the penis is very sensitive. This is obviously an un, a, a circumscribed sized penis. Um, I get lots of questions about the difference in sensations between circumcised and uncircumcised. And basically um, great sex can happen either direction. I'm just using this to show you the uh, anatomy. You've got the shaft and the head and the most sensitive part is the head, the glands, and then the coronal ridge at the uh, midway there. And so you can get skin conditions on the penis, the, the scrotum, when in high arousal, the scrotum pulls the testes back into the pelvic floor, similar to how the clitoris will, will go underneath the hood. So there can be all kinds of different conditions with male erectile functioning. Also, if there's damage to, I was actually buying a bike one time and I had just been at a training for the male pelvic floor. And the training had included how bike seats can damage the pelvic floor. And so <laughs> the guy selling me the bike said, so uh, what did you do today? And I was like, do you really want me to tell you? And I told him and he was like, he's this young 20 something year old biker. And I freaked him out about how bike riding can damage the pelvic floor. So be careful. Um, so damage to the pelvic floor can actually also be at play for male sexual functioning. And I actually do not know. It says here that I've, how many minutes do you guys have Bartoli's? I think I am like 15 minutes. Okay, good. Ah, I want to make sure I get through this. So let me just explain in, in the last five minutes, because I want to leave at least 10 for questions, how, what impacts desire and arousal? So I'm going to skip to this picture. See how this picture shows desire happens first, then arousal, then orgasm, then resolution. So this is what all sex therapists are trained in and all therapists are trained in and all medical doctors are trained in the desire, then arousal, then orgasm, the resolution. This is the model that was created in the sixties and seventies. And it's the one that's trained in now. And it is incorrect for 50% of the population, which is really a drag. So 70% of women past the childbearing years don't feel desire first. They life is full, children are hanging on them, they're tired, they don't go, ooh, I want to have sex during their day, but they have a good marriage, they love their partner, they do like orgasms, so once their partner says, hey, and she says, okay, and then they have sex, then her desire might kick in, and I'm going to show you that. Some men also don't feel desire first, right? I showed that to you. So this is the model that's being taught. And it's really problematic because if you don't have desire, it means you don't want me. You're not attracted to me. Something's wrong. When actually that's half the population that doesn't actually have desire beforehand. So maybe desire isn't really, low desire isn't really a problem. It's just that it happens differently. So what that means is this is the model Bassan came out with in 2000. It's, I use both models, by the way, because some people do 
have the first model. The majority of men do. But uh, most women, this was written originally as a female model. I use it for men and women where there's first, there's a willingness. So your partner says, hey, do you want to? And you say, sure. And then they start touching in an appropriate context. And this is my job as a sex therapist is working with the appropriate context. The relationship is good. There's mutual respect. They go on dates. They love each other. There's good affection. There's not a jackhammer going off next door. It's not freezing and or 120 degrees. So the appropriate context. So the touching starts and she in her brain and body starts going, Ooh, that's nice. And then she starts noticing arousal. That's the throbbing and tingling of the blood flow coming to the pelvic floor. And then she goes, oh, I'd like to have an orgasm. And Basan calls this responsive desire, meaning her desire doesn't kick in until when a relationship's in a good place, stuff gets going, right? And so then after that, she may reach an orgasm or she may not because she's tired, but boy, that was really good time touching. So there's satisfaction. But there's also some rewards like emotional intimacy and well-being and a lack of negative effects, like sex wasn't avoided. So the connection felt good. So the motivation might be higher. There might be multiple reasons for saying yes next time, but notice where it starts each time. Uh, Sure. Right. That's the willingness. When I uh, work with couples, I show them both models. I show them this one and this one. And I say, um, which one are you? So sometimes I'll have the female choose this one. She's got the higher desire. She'll pick this one. And the husband picks this one. Most of the time, it's the other way around. The wife will pick this one. The thing is, is it really releases this. This is how it's supposed to be. If you don't have desire, something's wrong. It doesn't mean that you can't do things to increase desire. If the Bartolis really want to organize this, I have a whole nother workshop that's called um, the dance of desire about how to improve sexual desire, but that's a whole separate class. Um, The reality is though, this alone really helps people knowing that this, I've got to have desire first. And why don't you feel desire? How about we focus instead on enjoyment? How about we focus on enjoyment? really bringing enjoyment to one another instead of I'm supposed to think about sex during the day. So I'm going to skip through this. Sorry, men, I'm skipping yours. All right. How do we have mutually fulfilling sexual activity? Yeah. Okay. I won't completely skip the males. Okay. Let me just mention that. Yes. As men age, it takes longer and firmer amount of stimulation to reach orgasm. Um, They do need direct stimulation. Sometimes men don't reach orgasm or erection because the wife isn't, she's like so afraid she's going to break him. And so she doesn't squeeze hard enough. Um, Testosterone does lower as people age, morning erections might happen less frequently. Nighttime erections happen less frequently, takes longer to reach orgasm. So I just want to mention, yes, I just don't have time to keep going there. All right. How do we have a mutually fulfilling sexual activity in marriage? How do we get to the fun, right? Um, I just realized I'm missing a slide, so I'm going to do it from memory. Think of these words, trees, swords, apples, lords, ladies, food, all-you-can-eat banquet, jewels, crowns, kings. Think of all those words, right? What do you picture in your mind? swords, food, jewels, right? Maybe a Renaissance fair, (laughs) maybe some Lord of the Rings, you know, like some kind of medieval, fun, romantic Lord and ladies movies. I, um, all of the words I just said are in Song of Solomon, are in Song of Solomon. God intends for sexuality to be fun and playful. He literally wrote a whole book. The the Bible is the only world religion text that has an entire book devoted to sensuality and sexuality. God intends for our sexuality to be fun. So how do we get there? So here's just a few practical tips. What does your wife need? So husbands, what does your wife need? First Peter three, be considerate as you live with your wife. That word considerate actually is the word gnosko, by the way, meaning deeply and intimately know her, investigate her, including 
really being a lifelong student of her body, which by the way, has all those many switches and dials and levers, being a nonstop student of her body that's ever changing, making sure that she, you're letting her know ahead of time when you want to have time together, Chain, making sure the atmosphere is good. How is your non-sexual touch going? How much are you playing? Do, do you share heart to heart? Do you have time where you guys are talking? Is there good conflict resolution? Um, are you complimenting her body the way Song of Solomon does? Look at Song of Solomon and look how they complement each other's bodies. Plan. Um, Song of Solomon 2.12, he says, arise, come with me. So he's planning on how to make her feel special. <laughs> I think this is just the funniest picture. So what does your wife need? Hmm. Consider <laughs> not ruining that romantic moment with a cherry bomb in the jacuzzi while she's getting all romantic. What does she need? She needs dates and she needs dates and she needs more dates and she needs more dates and she needs more dates and she needs dates. Needs dates right. What does your husband need? Okay. We're done. No, just kidding. <laughs> he needs other things as well. Watch him. Tell him what you see, compliment his body. He needs you to tell him what you need. Most husbands will say to me, I just want her to tell me, describe to me what she needs. He needs you wives to prioritize him above all others. Song of Song says, place me like a seal over your heart. He needs you to understand. We can, some, we can sometimes shame men for how much they, um, how se meaningful sex is to them and that it's a primary means for them that, of what feels connecting. They get a raise, they want to celebrate. They lose their job, they need to have sex. They are frustrated they're, and are disappointed, they want sex. They want to be, they, they feel excited and cheerful, they want to have sex. Like that sex is a primary means of connection isn't just for men, but it is more common for men. So not shaming that, understanding that. He needs your excited sounds. Um, this often happens where men will share, I just don't know that she's here. I don't feel like, I don't know if she's enjoying it because she doesn't ever let me know. She doesn't tell me. Um, women are often embarrassed about the weird noises that come out. There's this really funny um, cartoon and um, <laughs> it's about the male, but it's so funny. The wife, they're at a party and she says, Henry, show everybody that face you make when you have an orgasm. I mean, our faces do weird things. Our bodies do weird things. We make weird sounds. Um, I always talk about sex is messy. You know, you've got um, the, the lubricant, you've got the, the, the smushy stuff you're using the foam for your birth control. You've got uh, semen spilling out and coming down the legs. You've got maybe some urine sometimes and some blood sometimes, and somebody farts. Sex is messy. And so being able to talk openly about that messiness is a huge part of what makes sex better. So learning how to let those excited sounds come out and let the body do whatever it does is important. What else does your husband need? He needs you to spend some money uh, on your lingerie, on the bedroom. One of the things I do with couples is redo their bedroom. Uh, I give them input to redo their bedrooms, buy new bedding, buy new sheets, get the laundry out of your bedroom. Um, that's huge. Stop. If you're folding laundry in your bedroom, don't do that anymore. Um, the bedroom being the sanctuary, he needs you to share with him your sexual fantasies. What are things often what happens is women will tell me they've never actually shared their fantasies because women aren't supposed to think that way, right? Sharing your fantasies. And I mean, fantasies of what to do with your spouse, obviously tantalize him. You know, I, I joke about how I walk out the door with the skirt and put a thong on and flip it up and show him your thong before you walk out the door and make him think about it all day. You know, as you're getting ready to go on a date with friends, let him know what you have underneath and make him think about it all night long. So tantalize, blindside him with a surprise, you know, serve dinner naked, that kind of thing. Initiate and engage. So what are some, some other, oh, here it is, leaping, climbing. I did have it in here. Seeking, all of these words are in Song of Solomon. Jewels, earrings, ribbons, all you can eat buffets. Okay, all you can eat buffets isn't in Song of Solomon, but it mentions food constantly. Crowns, swords, shields. God intends for our sexuality to be fun, right? So in, I encourage playfulness. Um, go ahead and be a student of your spouse, have open communication, create new patterns of arousal, go buy some fun products, go buy um, glow in the dark paint and paint it all over each other's bodies and turn off the lights and look in the mirror, you know, go 
um, play strip poker and, and whoever wins the hand gets to decide, go buy whipped cream and use the whipped cream and say, here, lick this off and put it on the parts of your body. You want your, your spouse to lick off and kiss. There are so many things to do that can be playful and fun. These are, by the way, all of these suggestions I'm making are in the last two chapters of the book. If you want to go into detail, watch your expectations though. Um, we have this idea that the ultimate sex is when both of them have an orgasm at the same time. That's not how it works. Um, premature ejaculation, like watch your expectations. I'm supposed to last longer and women are supposed to have orgasm during intercourse and sex should always be about steak and lobster when sometimes it's macaroni and cheese. So really understanding that sex, sometimes good sex, sometimes is just, you know, that, good old warm meal that might not be all the heights and the flights. Having the occasional steak and lobster is a good idea. So watching expectations, a shower. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times this comes into my office. If she, if he would just shower. I just had a husband talk about um, his wife sent. I have women regularly talk about if he would just shave, if he would just take showers more often. So shower, shave, and then buy some fun products. Use a good lubricant. I put Astroglide in here, but what I actually recommend is um, liquid silk. I should get royalties for how many people buy liquid silk. Um, liquid silk. You can't find it at the store. You got to buy it online. Um, have some fun. Play and explore. Here's some pictures of the products. And here's my books. And the cards I tell people communicate. That's on the bottom there. And let me hear your voice from Song of Solomon. And I am done. <laughs> I am, by the way, I know we're done in two minutes. I, I don't, Bartoli's, I don't know if people can stay on or if even you can stay on. I can ask, answer questions as long as people want or they can send them to me, but we do have two minutes. Okay, why don't we open it up for some discussion? If people need to take off, you can take off. Um, let me. Is that what I want? No, I don't know what I did there. Oh. Boom. There it is. Okay. So if you want to raise your hand or if you want to, whatever it is, but if we do have, have a time for some Q and a, uh, let's fire away. If there's questions. I've just sent you a, um, fire hydrant of information. Right. Yeah. Gravity. 